What's up, everybody? Happy Friday. Welcome back to the Din the Dialogue, where we're going to be sharing something about the digital advertising industry that's going to impact you, the publisher. My name's Josh, and today we actually have a guest, Colin Sparaco with the Infatuation Zagat. He is currently the Senior Director of Digital Revenue Operations. Colin, to kick us off, can you share a little bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Josh, for having me on today. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to talk about publishing and where we are today in the future. Um, you know, I started my career about 12 years ago. Uh, I came from the sports world, worked at Major League Baseball, CBS Sports, NBC Sports. I've worked on every major sporting event from the Olympics to F1 racing. Um, I then changed a little bit of a career path to go into publishing. I uh, worked at Condé Nast at all their major brands for about three years. And now I've taken on a new challenge over here at the Infatuation in Zagat, uh, the users and the people's uh, restaurant decider platform that um, we believe uh, in, in the space that the restaurant industry is in, but also uh, we're, we're looking to diversify our revenue and grow our audiences in, in new ways that people are consuming. Very cool. Okay. Uh, before we jump into hearing a little more about the infatuations, Gat, I would love to hear how you actually transition there from F1 over to the, the publishing industry. Yeah. So, you know, sports is, and everybody knows this, live programming is the, the, the coup de grace, if you will. Um, and, and me just being a huge sports fan, playing sports growing up, it was a passion of mine to just actually just be in the space. And I've been extremely fortunate to see what it's like to work on the Super Bowl at two different companies, but also, you know, the, the, the Olympics, which is a worldwide event, um, which obviously there's way different consideration sets for something like that um, compared to, you know, just like your regular national sports. But, you know, when I went into publishing after that, because more so for me, it was a career change in addition to management experience. You know, I had the, the opportunity to either go the sales route or the operations management route. And that's the route that I chose because I always thought there was a lot more work to be done in the back of the house to support the front of the house. Um, and there's a lot more opportunity out there long-term. But uh, with that said, you know, at Condé Nast, they, their challenges were different than let's say an NBC or a CBS because those were already big networks. Uh, Condé Nast was already operating in silos by brand. So they actually were competing against themselves instead of teaming up and building their own network, which okay. you see a lot of publishers doing today and being that trusted uh, big network uh, with maximizing all your IP and your brand equity. Um, you see that being the world, that's where the world is going uh, with all these mergers and, and you know, the cookie going away and everybody being trusting in you know, journalism, but specific fact checking um, and that trusted source for timeliness as well. So I was able to learn a lot um, working at the New Yorker specifically you know, I went from the sports world to the news world and there are synergies there, but you can imagine that there are differences in terms of brand safety and what advertisers are looking for in terms of the political climate or, or just the news cycle in general. So I've been very fortunate to see how uh, users interact with that content, but also uh, from the publisher side, how do you maximize your revenue, not just from an ads perspective, but also, you know, subscriptions, affiliates and, and other avenues that you're supporting your users in terms of what they're looking for. Yeah, okay, and, and we'll come back to the, the monetization piece there, but definitely wanna hear a little bit of, of the transition to the infatuation in Zaga. So not only bringing what you learned over at Condé Nast and the New Yorker, but uh, maybe a little more about what the infatuation in Zagat really represent. Yeah, so what was exciting about the opportunity to come to the infatuation network and group is that they acquired Zagat from Google uh, in 2018, which Zagat has probably one of the best brand equities in the space for restaurant <laughs> decision making, if you think about it. That little, uh, you know, Bible or, or the maroon Bible, as some people uh, refer to it. You know, that was the first user generated content platform, if you think about it, right? Users at, at, the, at this time, we're talking about the 80s and 90s, you know, you had to snail mail everything in and take that survey and then actually, you know, hand compile it. Um, so now, you know, in the 21st century here, obviously the world's a little bit different and a way more faster and instant. Um, and I, I found it such a, to be an interesting opportunity to take this legacy brand 
and heritage and just really amplify it for today's world um, because the needs are still there for what the users are looking for. And, um, you know, we believe that we're building a user generated platform, hopefully launching early next year in 2021, that will uh, evangelize some of the, uh, or I should say, we want it to be a little bit more straightforward in terms of what that restaurant experience is compared to uh, some of the other reviews that you see out there um, that are just, you know, maybe somebody had a bad day or something like that, where we want to take that dining experience and elevate that and make sure that you have the right situational need for it. And that's how the infatuation comes into play. Zagat is a little bit more fine dining and a little bit more curated in, in, in that sense. But then the infatuation is a nice, it's a little bit of a younger audience, but also it's that situational play. You know, I'm looking for a date. I'm looking for, I have my in-laws in town. I'm looking, you know, to do a big party at 15, something like that. And, you know, when you think about trying to find a restaurant space for your group of five versus 15, you know, that situational need becomes imperative and you don't want to waste a lot of time and you want to have a good meal with that group because, you know, it's all about family experiences and, 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 and those social experiences in a safe way in today's world. Um, but every situational need is different and, and we trying to add the color to why those situational differences are different, but also make sure that you maximize your, your leisure time or even your business time and um, really just set the stage to, you know, enjoy your experience because, you know, you're there to have a good time and a good meal at the same time. Yeah. So it sounds like for the infatuation, there's almost an educational piece to it as well. It's, it's not just providing a sense of community and experience. Is that kind of along the lines? Yeah, we would say that for sure. I mean, you know, we're also restaurant advocates too. You know, we recently, you know, this year has changed a lot of people's businesses, right? And we have all these uh, movements that are really good for the world in general. And, you know, we used to be pretty critical, right? We used to have reviews right. and ratings and, you know, only our editors knew what that was. And, you know, we made the decision earlier this year that that's probably not the right way to continue to move forward to support restaurants, right? Why are we being critical of the restaurants when we should be thinking about it as supportive? And so we've changed our lens completely in terms of that sense. Um, and we're looking to just support the community. You know, right now we have a Feed the Polls initiative uh, we work with uh, the Who Org. Um, I forgot. Uh, I'll have to come back to that. Yeah. Uh, we work with other organizations that, um, you know, we're just making sure that the restaurants, you know, they had to fight for all this money in the beginning of the year and stuff like that. And we just wanted to make sure that as every city is different in terms of how they're getting back to normal or what their rules or regulations are in their towns, uh, we're just trying to make sure that these restaurants have the platform that they deserve but also that they keep their customers and user, our users um, happy and engaged and also just providing the services that everybody is looking for. And that's that sense of community in addition to that, that home cooked or really good meal. Yeah, that's, that's a really unique perspective. And to be honest, even me looking for a restaurant, I'll, I'll, I'll go on and take a look. And it, it, depending on how many ratings it has or what stars, I'm, I'm going to pick the restaurant and, and that, call it a day. But it's really cool because I feel you guys focus much more on both sides of the coin actually supporting the restaurant too which is really important especially if we want to make sure that the community continues to grow yeah absolutely you know we know that there are lifelines just like we are to them so you know with that said when there comes to monetization opportunities you know we have such great relationships with chefs and restaurants and we're able to do unique partnerships that a lot of other publishers are not able to do um and that's some of the special sauce that we bring to the table um, in, in terms of those collaborations. Because yeah. when we can get top chefs in certain cities to work together or collaborate, you know, that's where the magic happens. You see it on TV or, other, or in, in other situations. Um, and that's where we see, you know, it's just, it's just nice to just be in this network of people who care and are helpful and are always looking to put the community first. Um, and you know, that's where, that's where we come into play um, and kind of tying the dots to our customers, their customers, our user base, and you know, naturally you know, supporting the restaurant industry. Yeah, I love that. 
So that, that's a great segue actually into 2020, right? You kind of touched about how in the very beginning we had a, a different strategy, a different focus, even though the infatuation is still the infatuation, you still had a, a, a goal. How has the strategy changed or fluctuated as, as we've moved through 2020 and even getting ready and preparing for quarter four of 2020? For sure. I mean, I think everybody's world got flipped upside down. 2020, everybody <laughs> threw out the playbook that they designed in 2019. Created a new uh, one. <laughs> and, and that's okay, right? And that's, yeah. that's the way the world works. And I think, you know, being our revenue in particular, you know, was highly supported by in real life events. You know, that was kind of where we would bring these cool lifestyle events, whether we would be activating at the Super Bowl for clients or just throwing private parties for big corporations, um, you know, we came into play where we could curate food, restaurants, the space, and, and get the right crowd um, in, in front of the right people. So, you know, taking that, that that's our bread and butter and our DNA, you know, how, how do we, how do we continue our success? So we, you know, uh, we pivoted into virtual events, which we, we know a lot of other publishers have done. And, you know, to date, we've done over 20, three events, um, which is a lot, you know, we're averaging almost up to five a month. And, you know, we found some successes there in terms of formatting and talent and what our users are craving. Uh, and with all these virtual events too, which, you know, advertiser interest has peaked around it so that they can get their messaging out in a timely, timely fashion, uh, in a thematical fashion, because uh, we all know for advertisers, if the theme doesn't work, it's not going to, it ties back to the advertiser's brand, right. that messaging and weaving is going to fall flat to the audience, right? right? So you want it to feel authentic and natural. And, and we found a platform in virtual events where, you know, this is something that we can offer as custom to clients and, and make sure that, you know, our audience is engaged and, and has that, uh, something to do at home, but also get those, uh, branding points across. And with that said, too, you know, we, we're, we're looking at pivoting some of our content strategy as well, because, you know, yes, we're always going to be writing reviews on restaurants and, you know, telling you what's new in your neighborhood or what's reopened or what's closed just so it's utilitarian. Um, but we're also looking into lifestyle adjacencies about cocktails. And we've seen that, you know, now that people have time at home. You're not going out to buy that cocktail, but you have a little bit more time to actually make that cocktail, right? So how do I treat yourself at home? And, and we've, we have some former bar staff uh, tenders on our team that have that expertise. And, you know, we've turned those into social franchises, content on site. And we see that there's, you know, appetite for recipes and some other uh, ways to work with chefs in particular, where maybe we can do meal kits. Uh, we have the ability to do that. And we can also um, set up a, a platform for the chefs so that they can share their recipes or that they can collaborate in their neighborhoods. Um, and we can build these special programs that, you know, everybody wins. And I think, you know, with that said, everybody's probably looking at trying to change their content to see what is specific to them. But, you know, with us, we have a unique advantage of our FODI membership where we're, we're hard to aligned into our audience, you know, right. and tell us what they're looking for and what they need in, in specific cities too, because not every city is a one size fits all, you know, New York's needs are different than Miami's than Austin's or LA. So, you know, having that on the ground Intel and that two way dialogue between our audience, I think that's where we have seen our content pivot to be successful because we're listening, right? We're not here right. to just produce a bunch of stuff and hope it works. We're, we're actually trying to say, oh, okay, this is what people need and this is what people want and we can do that. Um, and we're here to listen and, 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 and do that in the right way. Yeah. So what do you think the, the most effective way of, of still communicating with the, that user base has been so far? I've seen a couple things. Uh, the, the wine night you guys are actually doing for a little while, uh, seven o'clock. Tuesday nights. So you definitely, I, I might have been one of those as well. But it, what are some different strategies that you have seen that have actually worked really well for your user base? Yeah. So um, some of the strategies, they range, I would say, mm -hmm. um, you know, our user base, um, you know, the, uh, we know about our users is that they're, they're researchers, they're intelligent. They tend to be the party planner or the curator of their group, the tastemaker, if you will. Um, so knowing that they were the leader of their group saying, all right, they're the decision maker, 
we're still trying to empower those folks to say, all right, these are the type of cocktails you should be making in this setting at home in your small group or with your family. Right. Um, and, and, and for Zagat, it's a little bit different in terms of the user base because everybody just wants to know how their favorite restaurant is doing or, how <laughs> right. that, or that chef is doing or, or how are they pivoting their menu? You know, for example, you know, the California, California wildfires, you know, have, have definitely disrupted supply chains for some of these restaurants. So some of the ingredients that were natural to the season, you know, what are chefs doing to overcome that, right? What are chefs doing to overcome, you know, the COVID uh, regulations in their community? Right. Um, and how are these folks surviving? And these are just like amazing stories of triumph, and, and perseverance that, you know, they're all feel good and, and everybody wants them to win, right? So, you know, Zagat's future, we see this being as the platform for chefs, kind of like the, the Players' Tribune is for athletes. Um, and, you know, the chefs, they need this platform, not just from a business sense, but also just they have amazing stories. Um, and these people tend to be resilient. And, you know, as we look at the world changing here, and the restaurant community kind of being in a little bit of a disarray. You know, we know that the, this subsector of the world and these types of personalities are going to succeed no matter what it takes. And we're here to give them every advantage that they can in order to succeed. Right. So there's the, the user base, some of the most effective ways in terms of reaching, reaching the users, but with the strategy change going from in-person events uh, being impacted, like some of our sports publishers too, I, I feel you guys kind of fall in the same bucket um, on the food side and restaurant industry. How has the, the revenue diversification kind of gone along as 2020 has gone on? I, I know you mentioned a couple of different ways of doing it, but what are, what are the biggest impacts there and where, where have you got creative? Sure. Yeah. I mean, our business was never fully supported by advertising. You know, it was right. always a large chunk. And we know that that our future probably, you know, and just like everybody else's future, you can't just be a completely ad based company. Um, it's just not, it's not practical and you can't resource that way. Um, fully, I would say. Yeah. So that said, I mean, everybody always wants always on money too, right? I always call it mailbox money and whether it's big or small, it doesn't matter. However, if you have the right strategy, this is what takes off, right? So listening to our user base, you know, we know that there's an opportunity in affiliate links because now that we've got, gotten into cocktails and everybody's home, well, now you need your barware, right? You need certain strainers and certain shakers and certain glasses for the fizz to happen correctly. And, um, you know, just so you can enjoy that drink the way it's supposed to be uh, drank, if you will. And it's, it's things like that, that um, us being a recommendation platform is something that we see helpful because our users have told us that, hey, we love what you tell us what to do or what we recommend. So knowing that it's working in the, hey, go to this restaurant for this situation. And now everybody has more time at home we're saying, all right, we can still recommend things. Maybe it's a soda stream, right? To enhance yeah. your, your cocktail, right? Or maybe it could be other household uh, items that we've never had to talk about, but now are super relevant to our user base. Um, so those are just op uh, white space opportunities that we're looking at on that front. But also we do have this membership, the Friends of the Infatuation, where it's kind of, we offer discounts, you know, for, for our, from our partners and exclusive offers for beer clubs and, and different types of kits that um, may not be available to you uh, naturally, or you wouldn't find on your, uh, yourself. And, you know, so where the friends of infatuation group comes into play, it's like, yeah, we used to throw a lot of events for these people. So we're, we're actually trying to give them other value adds, at, you know, whether it's virtual events, we're going to find a way to do safe in-person events and we have right. some strategies for next year for sure, which we could talk about in a little bit. But um, also it's just there, it goes back to us being an influencer and a big influencer. And, and it's also what our people are telling us that they want. So, you know, knowing that our writers are actually have expertise in the space, um, you know, we're kind of unique in, in terms of how we're set up on, on the editorial side because not everybody was uh, hired to, to be a writer. They were hired okay. to be themselves, I would say, and to be themselves 
in today's world it is definitely a privilege and something to take advantage of. And that's where unique point of views get brought to the, the table. And, you know, that's what our, t our, our user base is looking for. So, you know, that, that is just another opportunity that we're just scratching the surface on. Yeah. So in your, your user base, have you seen a primary spike in specific geos? Because I know you've got a couple of different locations that the infatuation works with. I um, mean, especially touching on some of those affiliate links, maybe barware or soda streams are going to be maybe a little more interesting to specific people in, in certain areas. Have you seen any kind of correlation there? For sure. I mean, our, our, our big markets are, are, are still chugging along. We've actually seen growth, um, to be honest with you. Yeah. you know, everybody saw a little bit of dip over the summer, but we're, we're back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and with that said, that means there's a lot of things happening in different cities. And we've definitely seen differences because, you know, for example, Austin has probably opened up way earlier than some other cities. So, um, the growth opportunity in Austin has probably been better than let's just say New York was earlier in the opportunity, our home base. But, you know, even though New York is our home base and LA is too, um, we, we've seen success in some of these other cities because every, everybody's in a different boat, you know? So just yeah. understanding that our editors are literally on the ground and listening to the community and, and literally finding out, we all know that some of this information is not necessarily super accessible, right? So right. where we were just, oh, we'll write a review on restaurants. No, we're telling you what's open and what's not and when things will open and can you go indoor dining here and is there outdoor dining and does it have a heat lamp because it's about to get cold? These are just like, they sound like kind of little things, but these are actually like some of the highest search uh, terms on the internet. And that's where, we, you know, we've seen our growth. We, we pay attention to search trends because that actually informs our content strategy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even when I'm searching for a restaurant, all, all those things you just mentioned are super important. Whether you're, you're going on a date, you're, you're bringing a larger group, no matter what, everybody's got things that they're looking for. And that's actually really interesting information, useful information. So how, how does that bleed into 2021, right? So you, you've got your strategy that I know you, you've kept some things, but I'm, I'm interested to hear what, what are some things that you maybe want to hold on to, expand on, or maybe even drop that, that you've already tested and said, there's no way this is working next year. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we've definitely had a couple failed experiments. And I would say that's more on the content side, you know, it's just, hey, we, we've tried this or that or this theme or that theme. And, you know, they kind of fell flat. And that's okay, right? You know, it kind of happens in a silo to a certain degree. But yeah, it forms. Um, what is trending and what is building for, for other successes. So for example, um, the reopening guides in, in, in certain cities, you know, we start in one city and it was highly trafficked in that city. So we're like, all right, that theme works in another city, right? And so on and so forth. So that sharing of information internally definitely helps with the content strategy um, because some of that is just organic and natural. Right. But uh, for, tw you know, looking into next year, we know the world wants to get back to where they were or some type of social events, you know, and I think we've been doing our due diligence on how can we do that safely um, and, and in a way that people are still excited uh, and still get the experience that they expect from, you know, something that are our food festivals in the past. So we have a couple ideas that, uh, and it's not actually like the logistics are, are definitely something you have to figure out, but we do have some things cooking up in specific cities where in, in large areas, whether they're airport hangars or parks or a combination of the two, um, we think that we can do more stuff in the food truck world. Um, we could still find a way to bring vendors, you know, ghost kitchens are a thing. These are, you know, like the, you, we've seen ghost belly success, right? Like, we, we, we think there, there is the ability to still support the restaurant community and set them up in a commercial real estate fashion so that they can prepare the meals and foods that they want to. And we still think we can do that in a safe way. So those are areas that we're exploring for sure. Um, but, you know, we're also just leaning heavy into digital content too. So we know that that in real world experience will, will be different um, and we're still going to find a way to do it. But knowing that time spent on page and on the internet is probably at an all time high. You know, we understand that people are reading about certain things and we're going to be a little bit more newsworthy. We're going to be a little bit more lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, 
we're going to be a little bit, we're going to start fringing out a little bit and, and just still always be anchored in food. Um, but we're, we're kind of um, exploring the waters outside of just restaurant because the sense of community and family and friends is always tied around food. It's not just restaurants. Um, and we're finding the lifestyle weave to weave it all together uh, for the long term. Yeah, that's, I mean, with food, I feel it is part of your lifestyle. So it's a, that's a, almost a, it needed to happen. Um, I, before we even move on, though, you've got to enlighten me. What, what's a ghost kitchen? A ghost, yeah. So there literally, there are areas, uh, warehouses and or just commercial kitchen setups that folks um, use. You know, a lot of personal trainers use this, right? If they have a meal kit or if they have like a gym, right? Okay. Like I, that's where I've heard that um, these folks doing it, they'll go in on a Sunday, they'll use the kitchen for five hours, they'll bang out all their meal prep, and then they can send it to their users for their weekly meal, right? Like that's probably just a one use case scenario. But there is just, there's a bunch of real estate out there with these kitchens that are going unused, right? So to do a quick pop-up on a certain corner in a certain neighborhood, there actually are resources that are available um, that everybody can use and we can, and we can build cool programs around it or, or stunts, you know, that are, are in a safe way right? You know, or, or promote uh, a collaboration, you know, where only the first 300 people get, you know, a lunchbox or something like that. So um, just understanding that, you know, the real estate market has definitely changed right now and, 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 and things are going unused. Um, there, everybody's still got to eat, you know, whether you're supporting, you know, the frontline folks, nurses and, uh, and first responders, or if you're just trying to do something nice for your community. Um, it, the, the, those opportunities are available and that's something that's in our wheelhouse that we can leverage. That's very cool. And, and I mean, back to the, the core strategy of community and lifestyle, like, I mean, that's a great example, an unused kitchen on, on doing some kind of pop-up. I've, I've been to a couple here in Orlando and absolutely love those. I, I, I see the invite and that's one of the first things I'm going to do on, on a Saturday morning over coffee. So it, that's really cool to hear that you guys are, are utilizing that. And thanks for the education there too. Uh, so, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, not only with your experience, but just going through the infatuation as a get this last year too, is any, any big advice, maybe your top two or three pieces of advice for publishers of any size right now trying to navigate the, the ad industry, if you had to pick a couple of, of nuggets for them, what do you think? Yeah. I would say number one is don't be afraid to experiment. Um, now is the time, right? The playbook was thrown out this year. Times are changing yeah. and be nimble. Uh, I think one of our successes is that we've been able to do this quickly. We, we haven't really uh, said, all right, we'll try this in six months and it never happened. No, we, we, we said, all right, we tried it six hours later, right? <laughs> um, and we said, let's, let's give it a whirl. Well, what do we got? It's an article, right? We can produce as many or, or as little as we want of these, but let's, let's get, let's test the waters and see, hey, does our audience have an appetite? And, you know, our, our audience is boisterous, so they tell us when they like it and when they don't. So, yeah. uh, you know, we get that, we get that two-way communication fairly quickly, whether it's on social, our, our FODI membership, um, or just, you know, our network in general um, in the business world. You know, it's just listen to your audience. They're the reason why you're there. Um, yeah. And, you, you know, their needs are changing just like yours are. So I think that's like rule number one. Don't, don't be afraid to experiment. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the second rule would just be just maximize um, your revenue as best you can. And what does that mean? What are all the entry points that you're using, right? Like, uh, what, what are you growing your revenue? In, in certain areas such as uh, ads, right? And for us, uh, the infatuation is a gap working with you guys, you know, our opportunity was we weren't leveraging the programmatic space and we didn't have our seats there. So, you know, we got our fill rate to 100% where we were sitting around 50%, right? So that's right. that mailbox money that we were talking about earlier. And, and what does that do? Not sure, we get a little bit more extra revenue, but also we're being exposed to advertisers we've never been exposed to. And that's giving us a way into the door to see what kind of partnerships and collaborations can we come to the, to the, the table with yeah. um, to, to build these integrated programs? Because we also understand that, you know, clients change, clients needs are changing. I think, you know, everybody was in the awareness game and, and that's, you're always going to need it, but those budgets are probably going to windle down now that everything is going to be way more scrutinized in terms of DR 
and that ROI. Um, yeah. I think performance marketing is going to be the, the theme of next year. Um, and how can you do more with less? And I think that's everybody, you know, is, is in that boat. But, you know, to that point, um, you got to perform for everybody in, in all their objectives, you know, whether that's moving product or getting people aware of their new product um, or something in between everybody's needs are different, but at the end of the day, somebody's always trying to sell something. Um, and, and, and we need to ensure that that messaging is organic to our audience, but also that our audience is responding nicely to it. And these are things that they need as well. Right. I was, I was just say that too. <laughs> We're all selling. It's just certain people get paid for it. So it's it, actually, it's, it's comforting to hear that from you. <laughs> totally. I mean, that's just the way the world goes round and round, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> So what would be the uh, easiest way for uh, the, the publishers watching today or any of the users watching today to get connected both with you and then the infatuation and the gaps? You know, that might be a two-pronged approach there. Yeah, I mean, if anybody wants to talk to me directly, find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best way to, to reach me. I'm happy to always just have a conversation and network. I think sharing information and ideas go further sometimes in a webinar. Um, the webinars and, and stuff like that are great and you should always be you have your ground uh, ears to the ground if you will but just having like open-ended conversations with folks in the industry I feel mm -hmm. like that's how I've always learned best you know it doesn't matter it's like for example at NBC and CBS uh, and Fox they all sell the Super Bowl right so what do they do they talk to each other every year because they want to make sure Bud Light spends more money with them this year and then three years from now right so yeah. I think some of those tidbits and, and some industry sharing uh, information is always good. Um, and I think, you know, the trends that I see are different trends than other publishers sees because that's more endemic to their business, you know? And I think those, those conversations um, I, I enjoy having because, you know, I'm not on Twitch today, for example, but like we do have a video content team and that we, we plan on, producing more video. So like I see that as white space, you know, it's not just it twitches. It's, oh, wow. It was for video gamers. It's really not anymore. You know, that, the, the, that platform is growing up in a, in a new way. Um, and there's white space for a lot of publishers there. Um, in addition to other platforms too, but to get in, in contact with us directly, you know, about the infatuation or Zagat, you can, you can always email us at partnerships at infatuation.com. Um, and we're happy to, to take your email and figure out what kind of collaborations we need, whether that's a B2B perspective or, or a partnerships perspective or somewhere in between. Uh, we definitely have a product team and some other uh, tricks up our sleeves that I don't want to give everything away. Right. That we, we can find uh, ways to integrate. And, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, for example, one of the things I didn't highlight earlier is that you know, we're working with Apple directly on our map pins uh, technology on our site where we are now infused into Apple Maps. Um, and now we're moving into Google Maps, which is, you know, we're supplementing their information and, and, and making it more robust because uh, naturally ours is a little bit better in terms of being curated. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Google and Apple are, are kind of looking for that trusted publisher in that sense as well. So you know, these are opportunities of expansion and something that you wouldn't think from a restaurant recommendation community, but we do have a technology platform too that we're also leveraging um, in other ways. Awesome. Well, Colin, thanks again for the time today. Really appreciate it. I think you provided a lot of great insight to all the publishers and users watching today. Uh, Anybody else watching that did the dialogue today, if you have any other questions or comments, leave them in the comments below. And I hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks for having me, Josh. Thanks, Colin.